Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Stuart Farmer, the Education Manager for the Institute of Physics in Scotland, and it gives me great, great pleasure to introduce this afternoon's session. Um, it came about because, obviously, because of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, the events such as the uh, normal sort of four-day-long uh, residential summer school that the Institute of Physics and CERC have organised now for quite a number of years uh, had to be cancelled. And of course, as part of the, the summer school, um, one of the four days is the Institute of Physics Stirling meeting, which also unfortunately had to be, be cancelled. So um, we put our heads together to see if we could actually do something to um, help fill the void that um, having these two very important and significant events in the, the Scottish Physics CLPL calendar uh, made by, by them being cancelled. And we um, have organised a series of online events and also a couple of um, self-study sessions, which uh, will be coming a little bit later than anticipated because of um, the, the, the lockdown, etc. And um, uh, we'll have, however, over the next um, four Tuesday afternoons, uh, four webinar sessions. And um, it's a great pleasure to be able to introduce Chris Hooley um, as part of the planning for the Stirling meeting and the uh, virtual uh, for the, the summer school. We had approached Chris and he was actually going to be doing two sessions for us. And um, uh, it was very high on the, the Stirling meetings planning uh, committee's uh, list when we were looking at uh, getting a, a speaker to kick off the, the Stirling meeting. Um, to uh, get a, a good speaker who could um, summarise the events of the last 100 years, because 2020 is the centenary of the Institute of Physics. Uh, and uh, what was going to be the theme for the, the Stirling meeting was uh, looking uh, at 100 years and also looking forward at physics for 100 years. And uh, it became very obvious when we were in the planning stage and looking for speakers that uh, when Chris was mentioned that he was a firm fav favourite amongst many of the people who had heard him speak before. And um, uh, in addition to that, as I said, he was going to do another um, session on relativity. So just outside the 100 years as part of the, the summer school. So when we um, decided to, to put together this webinar series, uh, he did have a choice of the, the two sessions, but we've plumped for the a um, hundred years, uh, very topical with the centenary of the Institute of Physics, and um, therefore gives me uh, pleasure to introduce Chris, senior lecturer at the University of St Andrews, um, and uh, uh, a great um, honour to have you uh, join us today. I, I know from her, an email that you have had a very busy schedule examining and doing online teaching in the last few days. So I know that um, um, your presence here uh, shouldn't be taken lightly. So um, with, without any further ado, uh, I'll mute myself and turn off my camera and welcome and over to you, Chris. Thank you very much, Stuart, for that fulsome introduction. It's always a pleasure to be uh, invited to do one of these things. Uh, thank you also to Gregor, who's been very helpful helping to get all of this set up and doing sound checks and video checks so that we uh, suspect it's all going to work. Um, I should, I, I mean, I like talking in an interactive way, and obviously there's a limit to how interactive fora like this can be, but I'd still like to keep it as interactive as possible. So please don't feel you have to sit on your questions until the end. I can see the chat window uh, in the corner of my screen. If there are things you'd like to sort of stop me and ask as we're going along, then please don't hesitate just to flag up there. Either either you know, either type the question briefly or, or just indicate that you'd like me to stop while you formulate it, um, and I'll slot that in at some appropriate moment. Um, so obviously also if there's anything wrong with the sound or anything wrong with the, um, the slides, please, please do signal that in the chat and, and we'll get onto it, by which I presumably mean Gregor will get onto it. There won't be anything I can do. Good. Um, so to begin, um, my name's Chris Hooley, and as, as has already been said, um, I'm a senior lecturer at the University of St Andrews. I've been at St Andrews now for almost 15 years. I'm pleased to see some people that I taught at St Andrews are in the audience today, which is, always gives a nice feeling of, of being at home. Um, 
We're part of the Scottish Universities Physics Alliance, SUPER, which is the other logo that you can see on the, the slide here. Um, and, uh, and this talk is about uh, the past, basically, or 100 years or so of the past. Um, just before I get going, I notice we may have some sound and video problems. Um, oh. Many people are typing things. Ah, oh, no, okay. So maybe it's localized. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm certainly getting sound and video all to your interest. Okay, then I'll go ahead. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, so let's start with a little outline. Of course, the most important thing to say about any talk like this is that the old maxim that to choose is always to exclude is particularly true when you're trying to summarize the history of anything, and particularly a field which has absorbed so much human effort as physics research in, in the past hundred years has absorbed. So I've taken out a few things that I think are key. Um, that doesn't mean that I think this list is exhaustive. There are dozens, if not hundreds, of other strands of research that have been very important and influential over the past hundred years, and a lot of them are not being mentioned here. Um, I've tried to strike a balance between things that have had direct effect on society and things that are important developments in how we understand the operation of the physical world. Um, of course, any important development in how we understand the operation of the physical world, I suspect, is going to have some impact on society in the future, uh, even if it hasn't now. Um, so the things I've chosen to focus on are the birth of modern quantum mechanics, which just fits into our 100-year frame of reference. Um, the old quantum mechanics is outside it to a large extent, but there was a big burst of activity in 1925 to 28, where essentially the foundations of modern quantum mechanics were laid. Um, and that is within the past hundred years, so I thought I'd say something about that. I'd like to talk about the semiconductor revolution. It's probably the most influential application of quantum mechanics to everyday life, and I think people don't always appreciate that it is an application of quantum mechanics to everyday life. People think of quantum mechanics as this kind of weird quasi-philosophical thing about the universe being random. Actually, it, it affects everything around us and, and the devices which I'm using to speak to you now um, would be scarcely possible without the, the development of quantum mechanics and the semiconductor revolution that followed on from it, which led to the microcomputer revolution in, in its turn. The third item on the list is much more uh, fundamental in some sense. Um, a lot of the 20th century was spent trying to figure out what the universe is made of at the smallest scales, um, and that you know, we, we started a you know, hundred years ago, we knew about the electron and that was basically it. Um, the proton was discovered shortly there afterwards, then the neutron, and then about 200 other particles um, and people were getting very worried in the 1960s that, that there was just this zoo of new particles being discovered. There seemed to be no order to anything. And then gradually the parton and the quark models were developed. Um, and we got into the situation we are now where we have quite a well-agreed and functioning standard model of particle physics. So these bu bullet points on quantum field theory, quantum electrodynamics, the standard model of particle physics, essentially tell parts of that story, how, how we were working out um, how the fundamental principles of quantum mechanics could be applied not just to particles but to fields, and how that description would allow us to account for you know, what matter is, is made of um, at, at the subatomic scale. And then the final marker I've chosen, which is quite recent, um, is the detection of gravitational waves. Part of the reason I've chosen to put this in, I mean, obviously it's important in its own right, but also it's a great shame that both of Einstein's big papers on relativity, the special relativity paper in 1905 and the sequence of general relativity papers in 1915, don't fall within the past hundred years. And yet we have to say something about relativity. And so the recent detection of gravitational waves is also a, a nice way to tie that bit of uh, the past over a hundred years ago um, in, into a modern uh, phenomenon, the, the discovery just a few years ago that we can actually detect uh, ripples in space-time coming from large-scale events going on in, in the nearby universe. Um, so yes, special relativity and general relativity I've listed here as the ones that got away. 
Um, and I'd like to end then by talking about some open problems. I did, uh, sometimes these things are presented as if physics is basically done. Physics is really not done. There are some fundamental uh, confusions about what's going on uh, in the universe at large right now, which have intensified significantly, uh, even over the course of my scientific career. Um, so I, I would say we're probably further than we were 30 years ago in terms of feeling that we have a secure picture of basically how the universe works, at least at large scales. Um, and I would like to say something about that, and we'll see how we go for time. Good. So let's start with the birth of modern quantum mechanics. Um, obviously, in terms of giving credit, quantum mechanics was an enterprise involving very, very large numbers of people. Um, and as is often and rather sadly the case in, in physics, um, in order to keep things manageable, credit tends to be given to the people at the top. Although I think it is fair to say that with the birth of the new quantum mechanics, it was the those who'd been round the block a bit and had quite a lot of experience who were driving the development of the ideas, um, even if they weren't necessarily doing all of the calculations themselves. So I picked out two. Um, these, if, if you ask anyone to name the two important papers of, of foundational modern quantum mechanics, I, I think most people would point to these two. Um, so one here in the red is Werner Heisenberg, uh, born in 1901 and died in the year I was born. Um, and the paper I'm pointing to is his paper from 1925, Quantum Theoretical Reinterpretation of Kinematic and Mechanical Relations. Um, and that basically, and the work around it, got him the Nobel Prize in Physics uh, in 1932. Um, pictured on the right is Erwin Schrödinger, um, 1887 to 1961. Um, and the paper I'm pointing to of his is called An Undulatory Theory, we would these days say a wave theory, and I don't quite know why he didn't, um, of the mechanics of atoms and molecules. And that was published in 1926, and he got the Nobel Prize in 1933. Um, very neat, they, they waited exactly the same number of years between Heisenberg's paper for his prize as they did between Schrodinger's paper for his prize, which seems pleasingly even-handed. Um, so I'm just going to tell you a little bit about uh, about what these two papers contain and how they fit into the, the intellectual history of, of 20th century physics. So it had been known for a while that the, so, so the electron was only discovered in the late 19th century. So the idea that there, and, and the idea of atoms really was, did not become popular in physics until the late 19th century. Um, people like Kelvin were, were still exploring possibilities that atoms might be sort of different topologies of knots in the ether and so on. There was, you know, the chemists accepted atoms in 1820 because of the law of definite proportions and this kind of thing. The physicists took substantially longer to decide that these fundamental building blocks of matter might be real. So it was only really in 1880 or so that people started to coalesce around the idea that, that there really were atoms, there was this fundamental indivisible unit of matter. Um, and quite soon after that, the electron was discovered, which was clearly a particle smaller than an atom, which could be extracted from atoms. And a big question then became, so what is subatomic structure? Right? There's, we, we have now hard on the heels of learning that there are atoms. We have learned that there are things smaller than atoms. And so the question of what is the structure of the atom became uh, a pressing one. And since the electron is electrically charged, and since attractive charges obey a one over r squared law, there was this nice idea that basically the force law that holds the electron around the nucleus in an atom is basically the same as the force law that holds uh, the Earth in orbit around the sun. Um, I mean, in one case, it's electricity, and in the other case, it's gravity. But the forces depend on distance in the same way, and so you'd expect the allowed orbits to, to be the same. That led to this idea that atoms are a little bit like solar systems, and if that were true, it would be a beautiful symmetry between you know, things on the 100 million mile scale and things on the you know, uh, 10 to the minus 10 meter scale. Um, However, it rapidly became clear that there were some features of atoms that did not look like solar systems. And in particular, in a solar system, you can put a planet at any radius you like around the host star. So if we, if we had sufficiently powerful rockets, we could put a planet in between Earth and Mars. There would be no problem in doing that. We could maneuver it to a, an orbit slightly further out or an orbit slightly further in. 
all orbits are in principle possible and which ones actually get occupied is just a matter of you know initial conditions how the solar system actually formed how the planets cleared each other out of the way when the disk was coalescing into planets if indeed that's what happened so in the case of atoms though there's a much sharper discreteness about it so i've shown uh, i've shown in this slide um, a picture of the uh, of the atomic emission spectrum of hydrogen. This is just the lines that are, are in the visible. And you notice that at most frequencies, it doesn't emit at all. Whereas if an electron was smoothly transiting from one orbit to another by crossing the ones in between, it would emit at a range of colors as it was making that journey. Um, and so the discrete nature of the atomic emission and absorption spectra was already a problem for this kind of solar system picture of the atom. And Bohr and Sommerfeld had worked out around 1910 that you could solve this problem by saying that only certain orbits were allowed. And they managed to write down a condition involving the Planck constant, which would allow you to determine the discrete set of orbits that were allowed. And this gives rise to a phrase that I'm sure everybody knows, um, which is quantum leap. So, so the question is, if an electron doesn't smoothly migrate from one of these allowed orbits to the next, then what does it do? And the answer is, well, it jumps. It, it does it in a, a wanna, as it were. And so an electron jumping from the second orbit to the first emits a particular color of light. And it's always the same color because you're always emitting the same lump of energy when the electron jumps from the second orbit to the first. So they were having some success, actually, in, in this picture in explaining why it was that discrete um, spectra were seen, provided that you're happy with the assumptions, which are that a discrete set of allowed orbits is permitted, unlike in the solar system where you can have any orbit you like, um, and that when an electron absorbs light, it jumps up to a higher orbit, and when it emits light, it jumps down to a lower orbit, and so the discrete set of allowed orbits gets translated into a discrete set of possible emitted colours of light. But of course the question that was hanging in the air is, well, why is that? <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, if, if it's not the case that uh, that planets can only occupy a discrete set of orbits, and if here the force laws are the same, what is it about electrons in atoms that means you can only have a discrete set of allowed orbits? And Schrodinger's answer to this, um, published in 1926, but kind of knocking around for a few years before that and present in the work of de Broglie and others and so on, um, is that we should stop thinking of the electrons as particles at all. And he pointed out that if the if actually the electron were a wave, then the discrete nature of the allowed orbits would be completely understandable because when you put a wave in a confined space, you naturally get these harmonics, right? Like waves in an organ pipe. There's a fundamental where you have exactly well in the atom you have exactly one wavelength of the wave wrapping around the orbit. Then there's a first harmonic where you have two wavelengths of the wave wrapping around the orbit. The second harmonic where you have three wavelengths of the wave wrapping around the orbit and so on. And you can't have two and a half wavelengths of the wave wrapping around the orbit um, because it's inconsistent with the fact that the orbit is closed and the thing comes back to the same point. So, so Schrodinger was motivated. He actually did this work in late 1925 while on a skiing holiday, according to the people he went on holiday with who were most annoyed that he just shut himself up in his cabin uh, and decided to derive the Schrodinger equation for the hydrogen atom. Um, the, but his, suggest, his point was, if we, if we could describe electrons as waves, then it would be very natural to understand why the set of allowed orbits should be discrete. They're just different harmonics of the electron wave. And so that seems all right. I mean, it solves a technical problem for us, why we should get a discrete spectrum. Um, but the question that remains uh, sort of hanging around, of course, is what is that wave? Um, I mean, we, when we think of waves such as sound waves in air, we know that they're actually movements of air molecules in sort of longitudinal vibrations of wave fronts. When we describe waves on strings, we know that what's actually moving is a bit of the string. So you might ask, well, what's moving 
when this electron wave waves, what, what's actually doing the waving. And in a, in the upshot turns out to be that nothing is waving uh, when, the, when the wave function waves. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a displacement wave. It's not a wave like uh, the displacement wave, that, the transverse displacement on a string or the longitudinal displacement of air in a sound wave. Um, it's not even like light, where the thing that's waving is something a little bit abstract, like the electric field. Here, the wave itself is the thing. It's, it's not a description of another thing. The, the wave is the fundamental thing. So, so the wave function is not a wave function of some other thing. It is just the wave function. And there was a lot of um, unhappiness about this idea that you could have uh, a wave function that satisfied a wave equation, but that wasn't actually describing the displacement of some more fundamental object. Um, but over the decades, basically, the theory did experimentally so well that people have come to, in some sense, believe that even if the physical picture we have is not quite right, the calculations we're doing must certainly be right. Um, and again, I point to the fact that all of the hardware that we're using to talk today has been built on the assumption that the Schrodinger equation is correct, um, and it works extremely well. So if the wave is not a displacement of a, a physical object, what is it? Well, here's where it gets very uncomfortable. So it turns out that what we want to say is that the wave describes the probability of finding the particle in a given region of space. If we make a measurement, and before we make a measurement, there's no definite answer to where the particle is. There is just the wave. And this is obviously very uncomfortable. It makes nature inherently random. I could take 10 identical hydrogen atoms, go into each of them, measure the position of the electron. I get a different answer in each case, not because the atoms were different in any way, but just because there's, a, there's an irreducible randomness in the outcome of such measurements. And people were very uncomfortable with that irreducible randomness. I show here an example of the double slit experiment where it seems very uncomfortable that successive electrons fired from the electron gun end up at different positions on the screen even though they went through precisely the same apparatus in precisely the same way. Um, but again all I can do really is appeal to experiment. I mean, when it comes to justifying physical theories all one can do is appeal to experiment. This theory is counterintuitive from a classical point of view but it has been spectacularly experimentally successful um, and I would say that you know, we, we should continue to think about why we find it counterintuitive, continue to think about whether there are things that we could do that would improve our sense of understanding it. But it feels very likely to me that you know, what, whatever the philosophical issues, the calculation we're doing does seem to work. OK, so that was topic one. Um, the birth of the modern quantum mechanics. And it was really this idea that we should give up on the, the notion of particles having trajectories altogether. We should swap out the physical objects that we thought the world was made of in favor of wave functions as the fundamental entities. And point particles are somehow things that happen when we make measurements, but they're not there otherwise. Very good. And in a sense, a lot of the next uh, three topics are unpacking some consequences of this. I mean, this was obviously a major revolution in the way we think about the world, um, probably the most major revolution since Newton, and arguably more, more major than Newton, I would suggest, because before Newton, even the Aristotelians thought of the world as being made of point particles moving around. They just disagreed on the laws of motion. Newton corrected the laws of motion, but kept the idea of point particles. Quantum mechanics nixes the idea of point particles completely. Um, of course, at large scales, we get back things that look approximately like point particles, but we're now told that that's you know, an approximation and not how things fundamentally are. Good. So item two, to which that led very directly, um, was the semiconductor revolution. Um, the lots of work, work done during the Second World War, particularly, was already starting to dr drive computing. Right? There, there were lots of 
uh, defense reasons for wanting to be able to do lots of fast calculations, ranging projectiles, cracking codes, and so on. And so the development of automatic computing devices was really being driven uh, to a large extent by military requirements in, in the early 20th century. Um, and for the first few decades of this, I mean, obviously Babbage was working on, on different engines and things in the 19th century already, but, um, but you know, solid state technology started to develop even before quantum mechanics was incorporated into it. But the pre-quantum mechanics computers look a bit like the, uh, the machine shown in the figure on the left. Actually, in a sense, there are three computers in this figure, um, because Marlin Westcoff and Ruth Lichterman, who, who are pictured here, uh, were also called computers. Computer used to be a, a term for a human um, who made computations using one of these devices, and only over time did it come to be a name for the device itself. So, so we have one thing in this picture that we would now call a computer. There are two things in this picture that would have been, or two people in this picture, who would have been called computers at the time, um, and so in some sense there are three in total. But you see that the human was very important in these early computing devices because they actually had to disconnect and reconnect wires in order to determine what computation happened next. So the human is a working piece of these early computing devices. The human looks at the output from one of the lights, unplugs a cable here, plugs it in here, unplugs it here, plugs it in here, waits for a bit for the next step of the computation to happen, looks at the output. And so the human is really functioning as a working part of the computer in, in these kinds of systems. Whereas now, we don't have that, right? Your, your laptop sits there and, and computes by itself. And you know that because while you're in the middle of typing a letter, it decides it's going to update Windows and you lose all of your information. So it clearly made that decision autonomously. Um, how did we do that? And this turns out to be a really crucial application of quantum mechanics, that this was possible. And the component that makes that possible is the transistor. And the transistor only works in practice because the semiconductors of which it's made are described by quantum mechanics. I'm just going to say a little bit about that. So I've chosen uh, here to show the, the three people who won the Nobel Prize for Physics in 1956. Um, for this, for inventing the first transistor, basically. And uh, an image of the first transistor is shown on the right. Um, this is the actual uh, object. This is the thing that they made, um, a Bell Laboratories and various other bits of New Jersey. Um, and the people are John Bardeen, William Shockley, and Walter Brattain. Um, I don't know whether you know, but there is only one person in history who's ever received two Nobel Prizes in physics, and that's John Bardeen the character in the round glasses on the left here. He's not as well known as he should be, in my opinion, perhaps because he didn't used to stick his tongue out at the camera or go and see the president with no socks. Um, but he had a really influential um, career in physics in the 20th century. So he was on one Nobel Prize in 1956 um, for the invention of the transistor, um, or making this working model of a transistor, and he was on a second Nobel Prize in physics in 1972 because he was co-inventor of the theory of superconductivity. And th that really seems to me like a, a lovely pair of prizes to have. One very practical, very device oriented, one very theoretical. You know, we'd, they, we'd had superconductors for decades, but nobody knew how they worked. Um, and he's the B in the Bardeen, Cooper and Schrieffer theory, BCS theory of how superconductors work. Um, so. What is this device and what's important about it? Well, you can get the importance of it by seeing that there are three wires coming into it. There's sort of one in the one on the top corner of the triangle, one on the other corner of the triangle, and one coming in from the top. And what this device is, is a it's like a sort of gate that controls the flow of electricity, but the flow is controlled by other electrical currents. So unlike in the original computer, where the flow of electricity was controlled by a human unplugging a wire. Here, the flow of electricity is comp controlled by an electrical impulse coming in along the wire from the top. And that electrical impulse, of course, could be coming from the output of another transistor. 
And this is the way in which you can build computers that, as it were, can program them themselves. They do their own internal reconnections according to the results of, of calculations that have already been carried out. And this transistor component is, is the crucial thing for achieving that. So this is just summarizing that. A key, key feature of information processing is that subsequent calculations must depend on the results of previous ones, and the transistor achieves this. It's basically a switch, but instead of being operated by a human, it's operated by another electrical contact. And with that human element removed, miniaturization and speed up of computers obviously have been remarkable. Um, and I just wanted to emphasize that the transistor's operation depends crucially on quantum mechanics. So just as there's a gap between the allowed orbits for the electron in the hydrogen atom, there's a gap between the allowed orbits, if you like, for electrons inside solid materials. And it's the existence of that gap that allows these switches to work. So if you, if you, park, um, if you park the voltage in that gap, then basically electrons can't enter the material because there are no states for them to go into. If you park the voltage uh, not in the gap, then electrons can enter. Uh, and so you can do this in principle with atoms as well, and people do do such experiments. Um, but it's that sort of on-off nature of having some available orbits and then some gap and then some available orbits and then some gap that allows you to make a good switch out of this device. And a good switch is exactly what you need for all the microcomputing that follows. Okay. Let's turn away from uh, semiconductors and technology and come back to what fundamental physicists were thinking about in this time. Um, and again, I've highlighted a couple. Um, Emmy Noether, actually, the, the paper I want to point to is slightly outside the 100 years, but it was absolutely crucial for a lot of the development that took place in quantum field theory uh, in the 1940s, 50s and 60s. And so I think she deserves a place here, even though strictly her publication was, was outside our 100 year limit. Um, and she won the Ackerman Teubner Memorial Award in 1932 for some of her work. Um, and then the other person I've pointed to is Richard Feynman. Um, he had a famous 1949 paper called Space Time Approach to Quantum Electrodynamics. And in particular, it introduced this kind of figure that I've shown in the middle of the slide, which is the so called Feynman diagram is a crucial aid to properly notating calculations in this area. You can actually do any calculation that's been done since 1949 without using Feynman diagrams. But the problem is they get so sprawling and so hard to keep under control that you won't in practice do it without making a mistake. So one of the things that Feynman really contributed to theoretical physics was some clever abbreviated notations that allowed people to take the calculations further than they've been able to take them before. Um, and Feynman was recipient of the Nobel Prize for Physics in, in 1965. So what's all this about? Well, this is really about the combination of the principles of quantum mechanics with one of the big theories from the 19th century, electromagnetism. So of course, you know, as soon as you discover a new theory, you start asking, well, what does it, what implications does it have for the theories that we already had? And one of the theories that we already had, which is the big success, really, of 19, well, one of the big successes of 19th century physics, is electromagnetism. Right? So the discovery that electricity and magnetism are aspects of the same thing. You can induce electrical currents by time-varying magnetic fields, waving magnets through loops, and so on. And eventually, the discovery that electric and magnetic forces are not directly uh, one particle acting on another, but they're transmitted via this entity in between called the electromagnetic field. Um, and that leads, of course, to relativity, because if you have to transmit things through a medium, then you can only transmit them as quickly as vibrations in that medium will travel. Vibrations in the electromagnetic field are light, and therefore you can only influence other objects at the speed of light um, or less because you have to transmit the influence of one object through the field to the other and excitations in the electromagnetic field cannot travel faster than the speed of light. So that's the sort of context. We, we enter the 20th century knowing that these forces are actually described by fields and so we need really then a quantum theory not just of the 
particles, but also of the fields themselves. And that turns out to be kind of a knotty problem, which, which we spent a lot of the sort of post-war period in, in the West and the East um, working on. Um, it was quite interesting to see how people tried to keep scientific collaborations going at the height of the Cold War. Um, lots of lots of um, lots of collectives of scientists um, worked together to get the papers translated, the textbooks translated, to maintain the flow of, of inter intellectual information uh, across the Iron Curtain, across which very little else could flow. So. The theory that we were on the trail of was quantum electrodynamics. Right? In other words, it's, it's electrodynamics, but incorporating the principles of quantum mechanics. And it turns out this is a really difficult problem. And what's difficult about it is the following. So Feynman basically uh, advanced this path integral idea, which says that if you want to know the total probability for a process, so say, say you're interested in scattering two charged particles off each other, they one influences the field of the other, so they repel, and then they go out at some, some other angle. And you'd like to know the amplitude, the sort of probability that if I send them in at an angle of 42 degrees, they'll come out at an angle of 39 degrees, or something like that. Um, Feynman pointed out that it's possible to calculate those probabilities by adding together contributions from all the different sort of physical paths the particles could take and all the different physical configurations that the field could go through. And you can make a big sum out of those. Um, and if you add up all those contributions, there are some minus signs, plus signs, things interfere, but you should get some number, which is in the end that probability. And very quickly after the theory had been formulated, people realized that there was an issue, which is that when you actually do that, then you very often get infinite answers. The sum doesn't converge. In other words, adding together all these different amplitudes for the different processes gives you an answer that doesn't make sense because it's infinite. And of course, if it's a probability, it should definitely be between zero and one. And I'm not going to have time in this talk to talk about how that problem was solved, but, but the solution of that problem contributes to basically three Nobel Prizes that were awarded in physics in, in the late 20th century. And the key idea was this idea of renormalization. And the idea is you'll put in so much kinetic energy that you'll break apart the bonds that were holding the thing together and all the constituent particles will come flying out. And then you have to build some clever device to catch them, um, which is an, you know, an analyzer or, or a detector, as they would call them now in, in particle physics terminology. So I've shown here um, an early and a late example, at least uh, within the 100 year period we're talking about. So this is Lawrence's cyclotron at Berkeley in 1939. A cyclotron is so called because it accelerates the charged particles round and round in a ring. Obviously, that's more practical. Um, if, if you want to accelerate, if you want to accelerate a child on a bike, you know the problem you have, that as you, you accelerate the child faster, you have to run faster and faster to keep up in order to keep applying the force. Um, so it's much better to accelerate a child round and round on a, you know, a swing attached to a tree or something so that you can just stand where you are and keep pushing the swing every time it comes round. Uh, and so the cyclotron is based on that idea that you can, you can make much more efficient devices for accelerating particles if you accelerate them in a circle and you just push them each time at the same point on the, the ring. Um, then you can make linear accelerators. Although there were linear accelerators built, there's a big one at Stanford, for example, the famous Stanford linear accelerator, or SLAC, uh, and there are plenty of others too. But I've chosen to concentrate on cyclotrons, so this is an early rotary accelerator. You can see it's uh, about the size of, of humans, um, and this is, of course, the most famous uh, rotary accelerator in the world at the moment, the CERN on the French-Swiss border, um, so this is a 27 kilometer ring. Um, so the, you accelerate things around the small ring and then you inject them into the big ring and then you accelerate them around the big ring. And then at these locations uh, where the rings cross over, LHCB and CMS, um, you smash them into each other um, and you have big detector banks that look to see what comes out. Um, and so the practical thing that people were trying to do with these calculations was to understand 
what was being seen in these accelerator experiments. And as I mentioned earlier, what's really remarkable is how much was being seen in these accelerator experiments. So, so in the early days, uh, even, even in the late 1930s and early 1940s, they started to see that there were new types of particle being produced in these accelerators, and they were being produced in bewildering numbers. And they started using up the alphabet that we had to refer to them as omega particles, delta particles, psi particles, sigma particles, pe people just pulling bits of the Greek and Roman alphabets out and running out. So you delta plus plus, delta plus, delta zero, delta minus, um, all, all Greek letters, Roman letters with superscripts and subscripts, and the list was getting disturbing. And of course, if you got into physics because you thought that lying there under the surface must be some basically simple description of the world, this was quite an upsetting time because here we were taking apart the fundamental constituents of matter and finding that there was just more and more complication inside all these apparently independent particles um, that were coming out in the accelerator experiments. We got up to two or three hundred at some point, um, which is really you wouldn't want to say fundamental for a theory that has two or three hundred types of basic particle. But people did start to notice patterns emerging in the spins and the charges and the masses of these particles. So here, for example, um, is a is a ten. Um, so so they came in groups of six and eight and ten, but people gradually started to notice as they tabulated their properties that you know, the delta minus, the delta zero, the delta plus, and the delta plus plus all had the same spin as each other, and they had charges that differed, charges Q, that differed by integers, uh, successive integers, so the charges are minus one, zero, plus one, and plus two. And then you have the sigma particles, which have charges minus one, zero, and one, and all are all spin one. Um, we've got, so this is isospin actually, which is why it's allowed to be negative, uh, and then you've got these two, which are, you know, so you, you can, people were starting to be able to group them into patterns. And it became natural to ask, do, do those patterns form because there are some constituents of these particles at a more fundamental level? And those turn out to be the quarks. Um, so what we would now say is that these 10 particles, which were previously considered fundamental, are actually just made of two different types of quark in different combinations. Um, and that led us to the standard model of particle physics, uh, which I've shown here. So we, we did eventually boil down the constituents of matter to a simpler list. Six quarks in three pairs, up and down, charmed and strange, top and bottom, or truth and beauty if you come from the US West Coast. Um, six uh, Six leptons in three pairs, the electron and its partner neutrino, the muon and its partner neutrino, the tauon and its partner neutrino. Four bosons carrying forces, the gluon, the photon, the W and Z bosons that carry the weak forces, and of course the famous Higgs boson, uh, which was hypothesized in the early 1960s in order to explain how it was that these force carrying particles could end up having mass. Um, and which was famously detected a few years ago um, in, in the Large Hadron Collider experiments. Um, so this little bump is the, uh, is the Higgs, or at least it's the experimental signature of the Higgs. So there's a lot that still is not fixed about the standard model of particle physics, or at least there's a lot that seems unsatisfactory. For example, why are there three families of quark rather than four? Why are there three families of lepton rather than four or six or seven or one? Uh, that, that seems to be an unexplained number of the standard model. We know that there are exactly three, but we don't know why. Why are the masses of the particles here so drastically different from each other? The electron is about 2,000 times lighter than the proton, which means it's you know five or 600 times lighter than the quarks. The neutrino is in turn several orders of magnitude lighter than the electron. In fact, when I was an undergraduate, the correct answer to the question, what is the mass of the neutrino, was zero. Uh, but of course, in reality, we never knew that it was zero. We just assumed that nature would not be so perverse 
as to give us a massive particle whose mass was so much less than the mass of the electron. Uh, and as always, when you bet against the perversity of nature, you lose. Uh, nature is that perverse. Um, but that, that problem is serious, I think. The, the fact that we have a standard model in which the fundamental particles have such widely differing masses feels very unnatural. And that's what's motivated a lot of research into physics beyond the standard model, um, you know, string theory, uh, which also has other motivations, um, and you know, other ways of trying to get below the surface here, if, if the standard model is the surface. The other thing you'll notice, of course, is there's a gluon, which carries the strong nuclear force. There's a photon, which carries electromagnetic forces. There are W and Z bosons, which carry the weak nuclear forces. But where is gravity? in this picture. Right? Obviously we know that particles interact with each other gravitationally. I'm sitting on a chair right now. Um, and, and yet that's not present in the standard model of particle physics at all. And it doesn't really matter if you're just going to do accelerator experiments because the particles are moving so quickly that they don't really fall down measurably during the time that the experiment is going on. And so gravity is not something important to describe. But if you want to think, for example, about particle production at the surface of a black hole, I mean, there you have a quantum process, which is the spontaneous production of particles from energy, uh, going on at the event horizon of a black hole, which is an intrinsically gravitational phenomenon. So if you want to think about some of these contexts in the universe, and you know, most, most galaxies do have a black hole at the center of them, as far as we now know, so we might care about this question. Um, then, then this model will not do it for you, and you have to try and uh, develop a, a better theory. So that brings me uh, to the final topic I wanted to mention, which is uh, brings us right back round to gravity and, and pre-quantum physics in some sense, which is the detection of gravitational waves. So obviously one person who has to be mentioned here is Albert Einstein. Um, I'm, I refer particularly to his paper, The Field Equations of Gravitation, which he published in 1915, which is basically the, the full formulation of his general theory of relativity. And what he posits in that paper, which is now very well established experimentally, um, is, is that gravity is a very unusual force because the other forces are carried by ripples in their own field. But gravity is carried by ripples in space-time itself. So not a field that is living in space-time, but actual ripples in the space-time in which everything else lives. And he predicted those ripples and he predicted their excitation spectrum and, and their dynamical properties in right at the beginning of the theory. Uh, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in, 19, in physics in 1921. It doesn't mention his theories of relativity, by the way, possibly because the Nobel Committee didn't yet regard them as sufficiently well confirmed. Um, but anyway, he, he got a prize and that will have to do. Um, and in the past 20 years, there's been a real push to try and experimentally detect the ripples in space-time that Einstein said ought to be there. Um, we've had indirect evidence for them actually for much longer than that. So if you, if you observe um, pairs of stars, you know, sometimes stars form these binaries one star captures another um, and they spiral round each other like this. And as the stars spiral round each other, they start to spiral in. Um, and the only explanation we really have for that is that they're emitting gravitational waves and they're losing energy by emitting gravitational waves. And so eventually they spiral into each other and they coalesce. And so there was an idea that you should be able to see the gravitational waves sent off by those binaries, you know, uh, or maybe even a pair of black holes orbiting each other, which would be the, the strongest signal you, you could hope to get. Um, but they're really hard to see. Gravitational waves are exceptionally weak. Uh, Gravity is a very weak force. And so they built this system for doing it, which, which is almost absurd in its simplicity which is that what you do is you just get an interferometer, right? So one of these devices where you split some light at a beam splitter and you send it along two mutually orthogonal arms. You bounce it off mirrors, you bring it back, and you look at the interference panel. And if one of those arms changes in length, then the interference fringes shift. And this is a very sensitive way of optically measuring distance. 
So they said, well, if we could screen out all of the other sources of noise, could we perhaps get to the point where if a gravitational wave came by, it would stretch one of the arms of this interferometer, and we would see that as a shift in the interference pattern when the beams were brought back together. Now, the kind of shift you're looking for here is a fraction of the width of an atomic nucleus. So these experiments have to be incredibly sensitive, and they spent a long time solving all the engineering problems of making an interferometer that's sensitive to displacements of the mirrors by that order of magnitude. But delightfully, in, in 2015, they observed, it wasn't published till 2016, but in 2015, they observed the first pretty clear signal of a gravitational wave event from a, a cosmic source. Um, and so these three uh, were co-awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2017 for that discovery. And here are the data. Uh, so there are two different ground stations um, for the, for the uh, LIGO interferometer, which is the one on which this was done. One in Hanford in Washington State in the US and one in Livingston, Louisiana. So that's a good distance apart. The idea being that if you have two ground stations and you're looking for a signal coming from space, if it's a lorry rumbling by or something, then it won't be the same lorry in Hanford as it is in Livingston. And so by looking for coincidences between the detections um, at the two ground stations adjusted for the time it would take a gravitational wave to get between them, um, you, can, you can be reasonably confident that this is cosmic and not terrestrial in its origin. And so here are the signals that they observed at Hanford uh, and at Livingston. Um, they're fitted with what you'd expect from the general relativity theory of two black holes spiraling into each other and merging. Um, and here's just a graphical representation at the bottom where you can see the frequency of the signal rising uh, as the black holes come together. This is like, you know, when you throw a coin on a table and it spins down and it starts to spin, it starts to kind of go round faster and faster and faster, and then finally it sort of zips up and settles. That's exactly this kind of chirp signal that you're getting here. So as the black holes get closer and closer, they orbit faster and faster, the frequency of the oscillations gets higher, and then eventually they smush into each other, which is the equivalent of the coin coming to rest on the table. So that was the 14th of September 2015. There have since been several other confirmed detections of gravitational waves from space. And this has now moved from a confirmation of Einstein's theory into a new type of astronomy, basically. So now we can look out at the universe, not just using light in, in all the various frequency bands where that's done, but using gravitational waves, which are a completely independent uh, channel for observing the world. And now we've actually seen uh, gravitational and light bursts from the same uh, merging pair. I think it was a neutron star falling into a black hole, but uh, don't quote me on that. So there's lots been done, but there's lots still to do. And I just wanted to point to, um, uh, in the last minute or two, um, some, some unanswered questions. Um, one of those is dark matter. So we've, there's lots of evidence accumulating from the rotation curves of galaxies, from lensing events, um, that the matter that we can see in the universe is actually a much smaller fraction than we thought of the matter that there is. So there's a lot of gravitating matter out there which is not sending off luminous signals. It's not, it's not clumped together enough for it to be visible using gravitational wave emission. But you can see it in the rotational properties of, of galaxies, for example, and you can see it when distant light sources bend round it and you get two copies of the same image. So there's lots of experimental evidence for this now. Um, and, and we don't know what it's made of at all. So, the, so there aren't very good candidates in the standard model for what dark matter could be made of. So many people are excited by the possibility that, that dark matter might be showing us some beyond standard model physics if we can ever work out what it is. Also, and this is, I think, hands down the most interesting discovery that's been made in my lifetime, the expansion of the universe appears to be accelerating. And if you think about it, that's absolutely what you would not expect if, in a theory of gravity, everything attracts everything else. Right? The, if everything attracts everything else, then one thing you can be sure of is that the expansion of the universe should be slowing down, and it might even at some point reverse. 
but you but you certainly wouldn't expect things to be driving out faster and faster as time goes by so something is pushing outwards and we've given that something the name of dark energy which obviously just shows that we have no idea what it is or how it works there there's a myriad of theories being considered at the moment for what dark energy might be but the acceleration of the expansion now appears to be pretty well established as a fact and so we do need to explain it and finally of course as i mentioned earlier there's the big question of quantum gravity we have no quantum field theory that includes gravity which means in a sense that the two pillars of 20th century physics quantum mechanics and the general theory of relativity continue to be mutually contradictory theories and there must be a parent theory which captures the physics from both of them because otherwise how does nature know how to behave at the surface of a black hole and she's clearly very comfortable with surfaces of black holes because they're all over the place so string theory loop quantum gravity foam theory i mean there are lots of possibilities being kicked around for this i don't think any has become definitively convincing yet um and in a sense, we might need better experiment also before we can really start to distinguish between these options. So, as Yogi Berra famously put it, uh, predictions are dangerous, especially about the future. Um, but I will venture one, which is that there will be plenty of physics to keep us busy for the next hundred years. OK. That's it. Um, I just want, before we finish, though, to point out that I'm reachable if anyone would like to discuss this any further. Um, so I've given here the web pages of Physics and Astronomy at St Andrews, the web page of my research group, um, my own email address. You're very welcome to get in touch. I do not promise to reply within 10 minutes, but I will try to reply uh, to anyone who writes with any questions. Um, and I've given my Twitter handle and, and my Instagram handle there as well. Feel free to get in touch that way if you like sending people pictures. Um, otherwise, that's me, and thank you very much for your attention, and I, I look forward to your questions. Uh, thank you very much, Chris. Um, under normal circumstances, you would have been getting a big round of applause on a nice sunny morning in Stirling, um, but um, <laughs> unfortunately these days uh, we can't do that, but I'm sure there is a, a virtual uh, sort of metaphorical um, round of applause going around right around the, the country uh, at the moment, uh, from sort of Unst to I think as far south as, as I mouth, and I I must admit that it was remiss of me um, at the start that I, I didn't welcome our two more international guests. Uh, we've been joined by Jenna from uh, Penniston in uh, Yorkshire and uh, Paul from uh, who I know teaches in a, a school on the north side of Dublin um, and may well be known to quite a number of the people joining us today, having been a long time um, IOP Ireland uh, physics coach as well. However, um, as you said, we do have um, a few minutes left for some questions. Um, I think uh, everybody was very quiet during the, the session. I think enthralled by your excellent narrative um, and summary of the events in physics, the key events in physics over the last 100 years. But uh, I would hope that there might well be uh, some questions uh, now in the, the chat box. So I think we'll just need to- I can see on one certainly, so- uh... Greg Riley, um, apologies if I've pronounced any of that incorrectly, at Caldervale writes, uh, I thought that string theory was on its way out. How relevant is it nowadays? That's an excellent question. So I, I wouldn't say that string theory is on its way out. I would say that it had a remarkable burst of attention um, 20 to 25 years ago. Um, and that remarkable burst of attention created a, a generation of kind of string theory gods. And for a while, string theory was what you know, all the undergraduates wanted to work on. That generated a number of people going into string theory, which was probably always unsustainable. In the, you know, there's, there, a research field reaches a certain size and it can't even really communicate internally. Um, you run risks of fracturing into camps. I, I, my own view is that we reached a point in say 2005 or 2007 um, where the number of people trying to conduct research in string theory just became a bit large to be manageable. So that tide has come back a little bit and, and I, I think it's fair to say there are not as many pure string theorists working now as there were 20 years ago. 
But on the other hand, some of the ideas that they've generated are leaking out into other areas. So you so you meet people who work on the correspondence between anti de Sitter space times and um, condensed matter undergoing phase transitions. That's a really exciting field that that came out of string theory. I've done a tiny little bit of work in that area myself, and some of my colleagues are much more involved. So it, it's a question of definition to some extent. There was this there was this explosion of ideas which then broadened out. And although you have fewer people working in sort of pure string theory now, the ideas that they've given to theoretical physics more broadly are still being followed up in, in lots of places. Uh, OK, uh, there are several other questions here, so let me take them, try and take them in the order in which they appear. Apologies if I've missed anyone who's already scrolled off the top of the screen. Um, so Tim asks, why does the weak force have two separate bosons? Yeah, that's a good question. Actually, in some sense, it has three because the W boson has a, a positively and a negatively charged version. So, so in a sense, there's a W plus, a W minus, and a Z. The, the basic reason for that is that it has to operate between more types of particle. So with the electromagnetic force, you've only got positive charge and negative charge. So there's so there's really only one kind of charge which can be plus or minus, and so you end up only needing one force carrier to mediate the force in between it. Even then, you know, you could argue that the photon is really two bosons because you can have two different polarizations of light, which means you can have two different polarizations of photon, and that's what a lot of these quantum information experiments are based on. So exactly how you count is not so obvious, and when you when you look at that standard model box it is hiding a lot of information like the fact that there are two polarizations of the photon two charges of the w boson two spin projections for the electron and all, all of that is kind of swept under the rug in, in the standard model um in the standard model picture so so the answer the answer in general is if you have a force that acts between um if, if, if a force acts between particles that have a more complicated type of charge, as the, as the leptons and the quarks do, then it needs to have more species in order to match onto that, basically. Um, there, there's more to say. If you want it in terms of symmetry groups, it's because the group is SU3, which is a more complicated group than U1. But, but fundamentally, it's, uh, you know, if you have more types of charge involved, you need more types of force carrier to carry the force. Uh, okay, Stuart asks, has the LHC reached its limit for uncovering new particles? Might dark matter be a super heavy particle or perhaps super light? Yeah, so the the LHC has not reached a hard limit, um, and indeed they're still doing upgrades and there are still planned upgrades to increase the uh, the energy that it gets to, but there there is a fundamental issue there, which is that as particles go to higher and higher energy, the fundamental quantum probability that they will interact with each other is reduced. It goes like one over the square of the energy. So as you go to higher and higher energy accelerators, irrespective of any of the other physics, there's just basic quantum mechanics that's telling you that the particles are more likely to go through each other and less likely to scatter off each other uh, when you send them towards each other at higher and higher energies. And because of that, for most of the, you know, they're having to run the LHC for months and months and months in order to get, you know, eight or nine candidate events um, on which they can take the statistics. So there's no kind of, there's no moment where you say it's completely run out. But every time you want to push up to higher energies, you also have to run for longer in order to get the same level of statistical confidence about the about the results you're taking in the end it someone is just going to look at one of these funding proposals and say well it, it's just got too expensive now um there may also be cleverer ways of it, the the whole idea of what things are made of is not so simple as it seems right so you may know that quarks actually cannot be separated to infinity 
So when I say that a proton is made of three quarks, you would normally understand that to mean that it can be taken apart into three quarks, and those three quarks can be taken off to large distances. But that's not the case for, for quarks. The, the um, quantum chromodynamics is a confined theory. You cannot separate the particles. When you do it, energy builds up in between them and it splurges into all these other particles that just get generated because you've increased the energy density in the space so much. So, so one way or another, I suspect that eventually we'll take a political decision to stop running such big accelerators or, or you know, not to drive the energy up by another two orders of magnitude. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to find smarter ways of investigating substructure of matter that don't just require that amount of brute force. Although, of course, it has been very, very productive uh, for the time that we've been running it so far. Could dark matter be super heavy or super light? I mean, yes, basically, we have we have very few constraints at the moment from experiment on what the distribution or lumpiness of dark matter could be on the scales that would matter for determining what kind of particle it is. Um, so I think I'd probably leave that answer at that. I, I, I wouldn't even know how to bed between those two choices. Um, yes, it could be super heavy. Yes, it could be super light. People have suggested that since neutrinos have mass, you might have neutrinos involved in, in dark matter. I mean, they are electrically neutral, so they don't scatter light very strongly. So it, it's a possibility, but there could, there could be many other things going on. Um, Matthew has asked, why do you think there are only three generations of matter? Do you personally think there's a fourth which is super heavy or is three it? So actually we have reasons for thinking that three may be it, because if, if you think that there are the same number of generations of leptons as there are quarks, then if there were another, if there were another lepton, so if there was something after the electron, the muon and the tauon, we'd presumably have seen that by now, unless the entire generation is incredibly heavy. Um, but it, but barring, barring, barring strangenesses, like the number of quark generations not being equal to the number of lepton generations, that would make the, um, the electroweak theory really difficult to write, by the way. Um, the, but yeah, so if we assume the number of generations for quarks is the same as the number of generations for leptons, I think we can be fairly confident there are only three generations for leptons. And in fact, there are collider experiments which which sort of where the total width of the resonance that you observe is proportional to the number of generations that there are. And that seems very consistent with three. So I so I think I, it's not exactly my field, but but I, I think that the weight of the evidence is that there are exactly three. But of course, that doesn't explain why. Uh, Stuart has asked, why no light from dark matter? Well, um, one of the obvious answers is that it's electrically neutral. Um, so to it, the way that light gets emitted is when you waggle electrically charged stuff around. So this is how radio antennas work. Right? You take charged particles, you waggle them between the top and the bottom of the antenna, and that causes the emission of electromagnetic radiation. If you could waggle a neutral particle up and down an antenna, then it wouldn't emit any radiation because it's electrically neutral. Um, now, of course, you might ask, well, how would I even waggle a neutral particle up and down an antenna? Fair point. But so what this tells us is that neutral particles are so much harder to control and so much harder to observe than charged particles. And so if dark matter is made of neutral particles, then it has pretty much assembled itself by gravitation, right? assuming that it has none of the charges that the other forces would be sensitive to. And it's moving around just under the gravitational influence of itself and the gravitational influence of the luminous matter in the universe. And I mean, there are quite, quite good simulations now of, of bits of cosmic history that show, you know, dark matter halos forming around galaxies roughly that where they would need to be in order to explain the rotation curves. So it's uh, the, the idea that it might be electrically neutral, but gravitating matter, I think is quite well supported. The question is what kind of electrically neutral but gravitating matter is it?
Uh, right. Uh, Lara has asked, do you think there can be interference between other types of bosons, perhaps the Higgs, like there is for photons, producing patterns in their fields? Yes, absolutely. I mean, there's uh, the, the unifying thing about quantum field theory is that it says that all particles are waves. The same would be true for the Higgs boson. So you could definitely have, uh, you could definitely in principle make a Higgs boson interferometer way or a Higgs boson two slit experiment. There's, there's, I mean, if, if the theory is even faintly right, then, then that should definitely be possible. Whether you could do it in practice, of course, well, probably not, right? The Higgs doesn't live for long. Um, you see it in a decay to two photons. So if the particle doesn't live long enough to get to the end of the interferometer and back, then your interferometry experiment is uh, sort of game over. Um, but as a matter of principle, absolutely, all, all quantum fields can show interference phenomena. You can, in principle, do the two-slit experiment with anything if you can keep it coherent for long enough. Do we have any more questions? I think we've run to the end of what's in the chat at the moment. If I've missed anyone, please uh, please drop me a quick note. But I think that's everything. I don't think you've missed anyone, Chris. So I think uh, you can give people a few seconds to put in a last uh, question because we do have a few minutes if if required. Or we're just giving uh, people a chance to ask any last questions. Just like to remind everyone that this is the first of four webinars and uh, the next one will be same time next Tuesday. Um, Chris was going to be the, the opening talk on the, the Wednesday of the Stirling meeting and summer school. And next week um, uh, it will be myself that gives the um, webinar and it will be the session on diagnostic questions, which was planned to be the, the, the Wednesday evening uh, session at the summer school. So we'll be um, repeating what would have been the, the top and tail of the Wednesday of the summer school uh, as part of this series. Um, and then we've got uh, two further um, sessions at the beginning of June, and they're all bookable via the CERC uh, Physics ELPL website, which I can see that uh, Gregor has just uh, posted a, a link at uh, perfect timing on the, the chat box. So if if no one's got any more questions, um, I would just like to round things off here. Uh, I hope that uh, those of you that have joined us this afternoon will see why it was when we were discussing a, a suitable speaker to summarise, um, you know, what's a very extensive 100 years of physics that um, Chris came top of our, our list. Um, I think you can all join with me again, giving that sort of virtual round of uh, applause uh, for what I think has been um, an excellent uh, talk this afternoon, uh, summarising uh, so many of the important uh, aspects of physics in the last 100 years. So thank you very much, Chris. And um, I know that you haven't been able to give you your other relativity talk um, that you were going to be doing as part of the summer school, but uh, I hope that there might be an opportunity to follow that up sometime in the future um, when things hopefully return a little bit more to normal. So uh, just to, to close for today, uh, thank you very much, and we hope to see everybody in the near future. So, thank you. Thank you, everyone. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for the invitation.